the biggest div divide in the world now is between people from somewhere and people from anywhere. Uh, and I do believe from a certain point of view, Eastern Europe stands very much for somewhere. <laughs>
um, anti-pluralist, leader-driven, demagogic, majority rule-based um, politics that may be very damaging to the future of democracy itself because the ultimate aim of these regimes is to um, create a political system in which they're in power forever. In the archives of the institute where he works, we find Professor Estvan Rev, the university's very first employee. He recalls how, at the moment when communism collapsed, the university represented a dream. Hello. The history of the university started not in Hungary, but started in Dubrovnik at the sea. Yugoslavia had a special in-between status between East and West, and so that was a meeting place. And during the course of the 1989 Summer University, George Soros was invited there. And by that time, it was obvious that communism was collapsing in East and Central Europe. And George Soros thought that perhaps it would be a good idea to set up an institution where uh, students coming from all the countries of East and Central Europe could learn together, who would be able to talk to each other even at the time of grave conflict. So this is how the idea of the university was born. As you can well imagine, this is a day of great pride and joy for me to see so many well-qualified people go out into the world. Ershabet Barat is a sociologist. She has taught gender studies at the Central European University for 20 years. It still is part of the mission statement of, of the institution that it wanted to make a difference in uh, Eastern Europe after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. What I would say is that that mission statement, especially because of the moment when the institution comes about, is uh, all sorts of liberal values. Okay, so but I would say like just for a very simplistic uh, comparison <laughs> or equivalence, that those values are very similar to the values of the uh, American Constitution and its amendments, okay? Like free speech, okay? Uh, f uh, freedom of opinion, freedom of religion, no discrimination in terms of, of your gender, sexuality, political disposition whatsoever, both in terms of doing research and also like carrying out your studies. But obviously all these values are particular values. The atmosphere, even at the beginning, was not very friendly. I, I remember that, um, especially in the humanities and social sciences, um, this was an area which was, as you can imagine, completely uh, politicized and ideologized during the time of communism. It was self-consciously an institution that tried to use and teach critical thinking, whereas state-owned universities receive their budget from the government and are dependent on the ever-changing political climate. Universities had to please uh, uh, those in power in order to receive sufficient funds. Um, whereas uh, this university enjoyed uh, complete freedom. So already at the very beginning, it was clear that um, somehow the university was an alien body in this part of the world where, as George Soros had predicted already back in uh, 89, nationalism became a very serious issue. This university 
always had a mission statement that was, it's of course about education, but also about the values. Mm. Um, was this somehow like, uh, I don't know, the spiders from Mars from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> um, this university uh, CEU was founded in 1991, and we were supposed to assist a transition that was going to go from communism to capitalist democracy and then a funny thing happened on the way to the to the transition which is that it turned after 2010 into a much more authoritarian populist direction and that just means our our mission is more important than ever and what is our mission our mission is simply to get up every morning and teach people how to be free human beings since when exactly has the, the CEU been declared an enemy of the state? It, uh, was that the gradual process? Yes, but openly, um, it happened last year in April when the government decided to pass a new higher education law uh, to set new conditions for the existence of especially this university. So in this situation, the government insists that those who think differently from the stated will of the majority are the enemies of the nation, are the enemies of the state. A university seen as enemy of the state. This becomes even more remarkable considering the fact that the leaders of the current government studied at this university, thanks to scholarships either from George Soros or from the university itself. Government spokesman Zoltan Kovacs, who believes the university conveys the wrong intellectual legacy, is just one example. Did you enjoy studying there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a high-level institution. I was a historian, uh, so in a kind of a non-political, uh, uh, non-ideological way, I was fulfilling my, uh, my studies actually in a, in a field which was 18th century British history. Uh, but again, now the thing is that uh, what we see here uh, is rather a misinterpretation of the existing world around us. For the past uh, couple of years, uh, especially since 2010, and especially in the arguments against Hungary and recently against Poland, we've seen an interpretation emerging, uh, according to which uh, there is a so-called liberal interpretation of the world, uh, that is basically everything around us. Uh, it is trying to monopolize all achievements in Europe as liberal, whatever it means. And everybody who is going against this supposed unity or monolithic um, perspective on politics, how politics should be running, uh, is not liberal or illiberal, as it, as it was called. And when it comes to, say, CEU and the academic uh, uh, arena, you have to keep in mind that uh, the academic arena is doing a lot, actually, to make that... Uh, uh, your conceived uh, perception or conception of democracy uh, even more widespread. When this um, orchestrated attack started a year and a half ago, then it started by singling out two departments of the various social scientific programs at CU because it's basically social science. And the two programs that were singled out was the sociology department for its Marxist uh, tendencies or legacies, I should say, and where I am um, gender, the gender studies department for its feminism. So these are the these were the two big no nos. And I see why they singled them out. <laughs> The government uh, took away the autonomy of the universities and appointed so-called chancellors uh, that are uh, centrally appointed uh, representatives to execute the central will at the universities. It is very easy then uh, to change the atmosphere and turn the country into something completely different. Tens of thousands of students and members of the public demonstrated against Orban's government and its violation of academic freedom. 
but to no avail. The government is not interested in purportedly universal liberal doctrines. Now, our perspective is that, first, you have to be aware of the legacies and traditions you carry in your own countries. If you try to get rid of them, uh, then an unnatural state of uh, political behavior is going to emerge, uh, which is going to uh, make it impossible, actually, to make proper and good decisions for your own community. The shift taking place in this part of Europe is towards tradition and custom, rather than any so-called universal values. To understand the causes of this shift, we visit a renowned Bulgarian political philosopher who is analyzing the deep rift between East and West. He teaches in Vienna, Ivan Krastev. Basically, part of the problem, particularly with some of the governments in the region, which you see with the Hungarians, what you see with the Poles, is a typical problem that you have with the second and the third generation of migrants. Because what happened in Eastern Europe in the last 30 years, basically, was a massive migration of the East to the West. Not only on the individual level, but with our states. We adopted Western institutions, Western norms, Western way of life. And what you know from the history of the individual migrants is the first generation basically is experiencing these changes as a success. So you have the generation of Havel, who tries to show that East Europeans are more European than Europeans. But then comes the second generation. And this second generation is becoming much more sensitive about the second class citizens. They're becoming much more aware of the importance of their tradition. They want to be recognized as equal, but also as different. And this is what I do believe we're seeing there. And this is why I do believe one of the major challenges is going to be to try to understand the position of Central Europe in all its complexity. Because it's very easy to dismiss some of the concerns of the people in the regions, but you should understand that Central and Eastern Europe is going through something, which I'm, social scientists call it moral panic. You have the feeling that the world as you know it does not exist anymore. You have so much vast changes that people cannot orient themselves and they are very much in a position to overreact. History is a very stubborn thing. You know, we're in Hungary here. Hungary had um, imperial rule until 1918 and 19. And then it had, you know, 30 years of interwar authoritarian rule. And then it had communism from 45 right through to 89. No soil in which a democratic culture could develop. And then suddenly we think, hey, presto, let's go. And it's not because, you know, Hungarians don't know what freedom is or have a taste for it or, they're kind of different from Western Europeans. I hate that condescension towards Eastern Europe. But these things take time. They take experience. You've got to build institutions. and They've got to work themselves through into the soil of a place. And so, you know, we've got this new kind of regime developing in Poland. Uh, we've got a new regime consolidating it in, in, um, in Hungary. And these regimes look at the world and they say, we're the future. We're not the, you know, we're the future. So if the history story went wrong, it went wrong right from the beginning, almost from the, the moment we were celebrating 1989, something new and strange began to happen. The free movement of, of the capital and the, and, and the goods, okay, f for a while inevitably had to bring with it the, the free flow of ideas and people traveling. But then uh, the free flow of ideas seems to stop. And I think it, it happened around, to me, the millennium. By then, I think the local forces have been uh, harnessed into a neoliberal system. And that, that means a very specific selection of ideas and, 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 and flows of beliefs and, and values and ideologies as well, I think. I mean, as far as what is expected to be the, the desirable one. So in fact, you say it's the openness that brought in 
the closeness within the agenda. Yes, or, exactly, yeah. exactly. And there was a lot of naive hope, mm -hmm. right? So in that sense, like it was unimaginable that if something seems to be opening up, then its outcome is actually closing down upon you. One of the major changes that we see with this nativist explosion in part of Central and Eastern Europe is that what is changing is the notion of normality. If in 1990s, normal was the West, and it was very much about political normality. It was about democracy, it was about market economy. Now normality is much more used in the traditional cultural terms. Western Europe, in the way we know it to a certain extent today, in cultural and political terms, was very much the results of the 1968. Uh, there was a kind of a major cultural transformation that went through the West European societies. 1968 was also very important for Eastern Europe. It was the Prague Spring. It was the protest of the Polish students in March 1968. But in Western Europe, 1968 was about the rights of the individual. It was very much about the rights of minorities. In Eastern Europe, it was very much about the right of the nation. It was very much about sovereignty. It was the Czechs and the Poles trying to basically resist the Sovietization of their part of the world. I'm saying this because this is a major difference. This is a major difference in the way you understand freedom, you understand rights. Even when they have a democratic elections, they want to reduce the constitutional court, they want to eliminate free media, uh, they want to get rid of free universities. And these things are the bastions of the freedom of everybody. Um, and yet they are described by these um, uh, new uh, leaders. They describe these institutions like courts, like universities, like free media, as kind of elite conspiracies against you know, the majority. No, these institutions are what keep everybody free. And this is a surprise. You know, I never thought that majority rule would become uncoupled from minority rights protections regimes, constitutional rule, independent judiciary, uh, free, free uh, media, free universities. I never thought democracy would be used against these guarantees of freedom. But that's the most surprising single thing, the ways in which we, the people, want to, you know, smash up the things that actually keep the people free. And this is the curve that history sent us that we never expected. The power brokers in Central Europe have some new views regarding democracy. In Poland, Bulgaria, Serbia, Croatia, Romania and Hungary, all hinges on strong leaders who want to control the media, justice and even education. How is it then possible to conduct an effective opposition? In Hungary, the answer comes from a group of radical artists who call themselves the dog with two tails. What was the moment in time that you all decided, you know, to enter politics? No, no, it was the other way around. It was really, it really made no sense to enter into politics when we did that, and probably that's why. So that's when we started promising eternal life and free beer. Igen, ez a pénzfal ehellet. Could you explain what is in the in there? Yesterday I went to the it's called the Rose Hills, which is like one of the richest districts areas in Budapest and I was gathering some fresh air from there. And now this is our gift to the people here in the middle of the city who have usually very bad air and I think uh, generally, also, there is a lot of bad air uh, these days here in the city and in Hungary, so I would like to give them this gift. And it's for free, which is very important, because of course it's also a means to uh, gain some sympathy. 
so that they give me their votes. This is how politics works. So I give them something for free and then I get the votes. Itt a rózsadon viola vegő, ingyen kampány szél a vitorlába! Jó napot kívánok! Elfogadna tőlem egy kis jó levegőt? További szép napot! I think there is a lot of fear somehow. But actually that's quite also a good thing to have a lot of fear because I mean if I if I manage to create some fear in people then they will respect me. So that's why also my outfit of course. The billboard campaign came at, at a time uh, in uh, Hungarian politics when the, when the government decided to use the, the migrant uh, crisis uh, to his own uh, liking. It was basically a hate campaign uh, against uh, immigrants and we made a very funny reaction to, well, you can Google that. The nationalism and populism of the Orban government was fanned by the refugee crisis of 2015. Within a few weeks, Hungary had built a 500 kilometer long fence to hold back migrants and refugees and had started a propaganda campaign fueling the fear for everything that is different. Tehát Magyarországnak egyetlen migránsa sincs szüksége. Tehát ahhoz, hogy a magyar gazdaság működjön, a magyar népesség fönnmaradjon, hogy Magyarországnak legyen jövője, ahhoz nekünk nincs szükségünk egyetlen migránsra sem. We drive with the mayor of the border city of Kubekaza to see the fence. Ugye mi pontosan a hármas határ találkozási pontján vagyunk, és én emlékszem, még gyerek voltam, amikor Szerbia részéről, amikor Szerbiából a Tito rendszer idején menekültek Szerbiából át Magyarországra, utána pedig a román Ceausescu rendszerbe menekültek. Tehát a, valahogy a, a kübekházi lakóknak beleívódott az életükbe, hogy itt mindig is volt migráció. Hogy néztek ki 2015-ben azok az emberek, akik érkeztek? Ide. Hát az a helyzet, hogy mi nem nagyon részesültünk a migrációból, kiestünk abból az útvonalból, de pár, pár, pár tucatnyian átjöttek nálunk is. Én egyikbe se láttam, hogy terrorista lett volna, kisgyerekek, idősek, felnőttek, nem csak férfiak, hanem nők is, családosok is. Nekem a szívem megesett rajtuk, mert láttam azt, hogy nagy nyomorúság elől menekültek, és én azon gondolkodtam állandóan, amikor őket láttam, hogy vajon mi mit csinálnánk magyarok, hogyha valaki egy bombát robbantana meg mondjuk a falunk közepébe, úgy gondolom, hogy mi is fognánk a, a sátorfánkat és mennénk. Ma Magyarország egy jövőkép nélküli, egy reménytelen, depressziós országá vált. 30 évvel ezelőtt, 88, 89, 90 tájékán egy reményteljes jövőképet láttunk magunk előtt. Él lovasai voltak, voltunk a kelet-európai blokknak a, a fölszámolásának, és én olyan büszke voltam arra, hogy magyar vagyok. Most szégyenkezem, amikor külföldre megyek, és megtudják, hogy magyar vagyok. Ez a megyei lapunk. Ez a megyei lapunk. Minden nap megjelenik egy ilyen hirdetés. Ennek a hirdetésnek költsége szerintem minimum 1 millió forint per nap. A, nap, a lapot pár hónap ezelőtt megvette Orbán Viktornak a, az egyik embere, tehát tulajdonképpen egy, a megyei lapunk egy magánlap, és hát a kormányzat úgy igyekszik ki stafírozni, úgy támogatni ezt a lapot, hogy fizetett hirdetést, semmit mondó fizetett hirdetést jelentett meg naponta, a médiába, és hát ezzel juttatja őket állami forráshoz, magyarán mondva pénzmosás történik. Tehát ez a biznisz, ez a, ez a menekült válságos biznisz, ez tulajdonképpen nem csak a hatalom koncentrációját jelenti, hanem tulajdonképpen egy pénzmosás is. Bekapok 
Why is Mr. Soros an enemy of the state? Well, Mr. Soros made himself a symbolic figure uh, with uh, illegal migration and migration issues. Uh, but very obviously, we know that Mr. Soros's uh, uh, actions, his activities, the framework, the network he's built for the past couple of decades goes beyond migration. It's a different worldview, which in many respects actually is reflecting uh, the differences we've been uh, talking about here. If someone believes that mass migration on an intercontinental level is not a bad thing and a danger to your everyday uh, security and causes and poses major threats actually to the borders and territorial integrity of European member states and Europe itself, but it's something desirable and you incite it, and you soften up the rules actually by which migrants by tens or maybe hundreds of millions can move around the globe, uh, I believe uh, it's really alarming, isn't it? Uh, there's no such human right, and this is a recent suggestion actually, coming on a UN level, and some apostles uh, even in Europe, including Mr. Soros and others, suggest that there is some, something like a human right to move around the globe as you desire. It's a human right to change countries. Uh, because uh, not only for, say, political reasons when you are being persecuted, but also if you live in misery. Uh, but that's a misconception, uh, because there are hundreds of millions of people who at a given moment can or should decide that they would like to live, say, in France, in Germany, or in the Netherlands, or in the United States, and it's impossible to accept that they can do that freely. It's impossible. I mean, this, this is not a world we can accept uh, is going to exist because that would take away the very essence of the existence of our communities and definitely, we believe, would take away the very essence of what we believe Europe is. Look, uh, one element of the, what, it, what we call the populist revolt that is in Eastern Europe and Western Europe alike is a revolt against human rights universalism against the idea that the sovereignty of states should be limited by and constrained by international legal obligations which are universal. And so that uh, these populist majorities are saying, why do we have obligations to those strangers at our door? I mean, we cannot acknowledge duties towards our fellow citizens, but why do this guy beyond the fence have a right to come into my home, right? And so this is a contradiction between democratic sovereignty and universal human rights. And again, we didn't see this coming because we thought that democracy was a universal human right. We never thought that the two might be, come into conflict. And, th and that's what's happening. When the second Orban government came into power in 2010, the emphasis shifted from our belonging to Europe, our belonging to the West, to the emphasis of our Christian roots and the fact that Hungary has always tried to defend the West from the forces coming to destroy it. This is what Hungary did, according to the Orban government, uh, already in the 13th century, fighting against the Mongolians. This is what we did against the Ottomans. This is what we tried to do during the Second World War. And this, according to the Prime Minister, exactly what we are doing today, when we try to stop the flow of refugees, One uh, revelative uh, experience after the fall of communism was regaining national sovereignty and regaining the ability to decide about yourself in a way that would ensure that your community uh, fosters. It uh, grows uh, and you know, can uh, uh, close the gap, say, between uh, the West and the East uh, and go towards the desired direction. Now, um, coming to the European Union, we obviously knew back in 2004 that we had to give up certain elements of our sovereignty. 
But recently, especially for the past, uh, say, 10 years, since the economic crisis and um, uh, uh, the test of the uh, migration crisis, we increasingly see that uh, European institutions are going beyond their mandate and are stealing away the elements of sovereignty which um, governments and countries, including Western European countries, have never given up. So uh, this is an experience, say, for the Hungarian people, and definitely the Hungarian government, that uh, step by step, in a hidden stealth way, as we say, uh, European institutions are trying to take away uh, elements of sovereignty, which again, uh, we believe belong to us, and we, are not, uh, we weren't ready and we are not ready to give up, say, uh, determine who shall we live together in the country, uh, who shall be coming to this country uh, without the consent uh, of a territorial state. What we see in the clash between East and West of Europe that was triggered by the migration crisis cannot be reduced simply to certain policies of a German government or Hungarian government. It goes much deeper. Most of the West European nations have been also colonial empires. They have been going to outside world, they're seeing much more of the outside world, and basically they were seeing the world as their place. While East Europeans, none of East European nations has a colonial history, which means much less encounter with the outside world, no sense of guilt, but also for us, world is Europe. So we are much more Eurocentric, and for us, Europe is not so much an idea, but also a place, and place to be defended. So the spirit of the place, loyalty to the place, is becoming critically important. British sociologist David Goodhart said that the biggest div divide in the world now is between people from somewhere and people from anywhere. Uh, and I do believe from a certain point of view, Eastern Europe stands very much for somewhere. The fundamental difference between people who view the world from a global perspective and those who can only see things on a local level becomes very clear during a meeting between two students who are studying at different universities. This has clearly had quite an influence on their opinions. We're studying, uh, he's studying law. Yeah. In a Catholic university in Budapest. Okay. Yeah. And I'm studying diplomatics in the National University of Public Services, which is uh, like a very uh, government close university. Ah, so, so you're an outsider, right? Uh, yeah, in a way I am, but, but there are a lot of outsiders, just as I am. Um, could you explain to me why the current government is so popular in the country? They make themselves popular. They are always building on the fears, the fears of, uh, of, of the people they have about migrants, like dark colored skin people, taking away jobs, taking away money, taking away everything. And if you have the control of fears, you have everything. You're, you won. That's the thing they have, and that's the thing we try to make people just think about, that, uh, that they don't have to fear. It's not necessary to fear in your life. You just live it without fears. You have to live it without fears because that, that life you live with fears is shit. If I can use this word. You were explaining to me before that. Yeah, something totally different. Okay. Yeah, I can tell you that. Yeah. So I think that what I have already told you that uh, Hungary, Hungarian um, <coughs> history was totally different from, uh, from the Western history. So it was like we lived together with the Austrians. We were under oppression. Uh, under oppression of the of the Turkish Empire, like the uh, Osman Empire, uh, then the uh, in oppression under oppression of the of the Austrian kings. So like the Hungarian soul, I think, at least my soul is totally different from uh, from from a Western Europe, like from a French person. And yeah, we can talk about fear, we can talk about anything else. But the main point is that the, I think that the, that our soul is much different. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think Hungarians are, um, yeah, we can say that they are afraid, but they want to keep their country because we had a much bigger country like before, 100 years before. What makes this narrative so uh, powerful or successful? Um, one element that makes it 
successful, uh, it's its reliance on national sentiments. That although it seems that we Hungarians have always been victims, in fact, we have always been martyrs and heroes. And to a certain extent, today, even today, we are heroes, which the world does not want to recognize. The world has never, ever recognized that. This is what makes it powerful. Listen, for East Europeans, and this is the major difference of the experience of the 20th century, you basically, Eastern Europe was experienced its 20th century as a victim. And by the way, this is why it's so difficult for us to recognize the victimhood of others. So this is a major story. And this idea that basically history is a tragic thing, that bad thing can happen, that every political project is a fragile one and everything can go wrong. I do believe this is very much in the way Central and Eastern Europe was experiencing uh, its, uh, 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 its identity. In the West, what has happened because of this kind of a long 70 years of success and others, the idea of this type of post-national identity and so on, uh, this is much more the idea that the world is the place to be made by us. Uh, for Central and East European, the world is much more things that happen to us than which basically we happen to others. And this is why even when it comes to pessimism, to optimism and so on, it's very different. To a certain extent, the reaction, uh, political reaction, and move to the right very much triggered by the migration crisis, was a kind of a delayed result of the trauma, not of the people who can come, but the people that have left for the last 15, 20 years. And listen, in many of the East European countries, it was more than 15% of the population that have left. Many of these people are younger and more entrepreneurial people. But suddenly, you are living in a place which others want to leave. And being in a place, even succeeding in a place which others are living, is very much kind of devaluing your own success. Especially if you think of the 500,000 who are the, of the more educated, more skilled uh, uh, people in their 30s and 40s, and now in, in their 20s as well. So those who are really in their more, most productive uh, years. So, we, so without them, okay, there is no hope here. Many of them are leaving. They do not. They do not imagine their life here. I think most of the Hungarians would say that I imagine my life in the next 15 years in the West because I don't want to stay here with so much uh, stupid people. In the EU, workforce uh, goes where work is, and it's right. I have a yeah. different opinion. Uh, <laughs> I would so say yeah. like, I would work here. Like I would work for for the country. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, a, maybe to rise up, yeah. You feel it's just a dedication? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but maybe it's it's because of, of the family, like, I grew up like that. Like, maybe it's not... Yeah, it's a, it's a not real... Not logical or not? Yeah. yeah that, would be a, that would be an easier way. Well, it, like, it to... to do yeah, to move abroad, but I, yeah. I would... Yeah, it's a really tough maybe question. Maybe it would be easier, but I, I would stay at home. Ich hoffe, dass Ihnen das Video gefallen hat. Klicken Sie hier, um das empfohlene Video anzusehen. Bitte abonnieren Sie unseren Kanal, um Updates über VPRO-Doc zu erhalten.